Hello folks, welcome back. Pastor Bob. Today, my title is The Exalted Servant. I will be in Philippians chapter 2 to start with. And there's things in here for us in the first few verses, but then it gets really good at the end. Not that it's really good no matter what, but we'll talk more about Christ. And then we're going to be in Isaiah. And so, without further ado, we're going to start. So, I'll look to the computer left. Welcome back, and God bless you. I hope you had a nice Thanksgiving. And here we go. If there be any, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercy, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but lowliness of mind. Let each esteem other better than himself. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Wherefore God has highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. <clears throat> well, that's powerful, isn't it? Here it says here, if there's any therefore consolation. What's that mean? If there's any kind of comfort, any kind of solace or admonition or encouragement, that which affords comfort or refreshment. And, he, and then it says, any consolation of spirit. Any comfort, it's very close to the same thing. It's not the same Greek word. It means any persuasiveness, address, or comfort verbally of love. Anytime you see, at least in this one, it's agape. And that is that affection, goodwill, benevolent love. And when it comes to God, it's what he deems necessary for the one being loved. An awesome word, agape. There be any fellowship. Now, you know what fellowship means? It does mean communion. It's a word called koinonia. It means joint participation, and intimacy, and again, in a, in a good way, and association. So if there be any comfort of love, any fellowship of the Spirit. Now, the Spirit, you know, if I asked you, what does it mean to have the Spirit within you? What would you say? You know, let me give you what the Greek says, and it kind of really sums it up really nice. The Spirit is man's immaterial nature, which enables him to communicate with God, who is also what? A Spirit. So it allows us to communicate with the Lord, because we have the Spirit within us, and we can talk to Him, because God is a Spirit, we're not. If any bowels. Now, when you see the bowels, a lot of times it's, it's really an inward, just a deep thing, inward affection, meaning in, it, it says, in my ardent love to Christ. Ardent means a warmth of feeling or a zealous supportive activity. So sometimes they use uh, English words in the Greek to describe what it means. And so the ardent here means the warm of feeling, zealous, and uh, support or activity. Okay? If there are any bowels and any mercy. That mercy is here. I love it. Because the mercies of God are new every day. How many know that? It's true. It means here in the New Testament means compassion. Heart of compassion. Manifestation of what? Pity. Comparison. Uh, excuse me, compassion, which one shows for the suffering of others. And I'm sure all you folks have compassion, you know, when, when something happens in somebody's family or, you know, to a child or anything, you know, it just breaks your heart, you know, you, you, you empathize with them and you just have compassion. Is there anything I can do, you know, verse 2. And again, Paul's asking, he said, fulfill my joy that you be what? Like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord and one mind. Hallelujah. That's basically one mind and all that is kind of like unity of spirit. Amen. Well, here it says, fulfill my joy. And it means make it full, would you? Fulfill it up. Um, cause it to abound and furnish or supply liberally. What? My joy. His gladness, his cause or occasion of joy. To be what? Like-minded. Let me say something to you. As a pastor, and I've been doing this most of my life, I've been in ministry since my early 20s. And if there's anything in any church that I've ever been, if it's not like-minded, you have problems. 
It means to be of the same mind. You know, you and I believe in Jesus Christ. We've got to believe everything it says. Be of the same mind. Cherish the same views. And to be of one's party. We're not talking Democrat or Republican. We're talking about the Lord's party and what he, he deems. Amen. We need to be like-minded what it says in the Word of God. Like-minded and the same love. And again, that's agape again. The same affection. The same goodwill. The same benevolence. And the same brotherly love. Uh, being of one accord. And that uh, means one mind. Being of one accord it means one mind along with it. One mind here is the same Greek word as like-minded. I'll reiterate it again. And it means to be of the same mind, cherish the same views, and to be of one's party. And again, whose party? God's party. May I submit that's God's word. Amen. Now it says this in verse 2. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory. But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. I like that. You know, strife is not good. But let me tell you what strife is here, at least in this particular one. It means it's electioneering or intriguing for office, a desire to put oneself forward. You know, the church that I pastor, I have a great bunch of people, but there was a time that somebody wanted at one time, they, you know, they, they wanted to get into the place of leadership. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but when you're electioneering and you're just trying to push your way through, that's not how God works. You know, your gift will make room for you. So you don't need to electioneer, you know, that's what it means, electioneering or intriguing for office, you know. And this is my version of it in just a hillbilly way. It's like the scratch and claw to try to get to the top. It's always good to want to do better in God, but you've got to let him promote you and not you promote yourself. So vain glory. It means vain opinions, empty pride, desire for praise. You know, I think all of us, and I'm not talking about, you know, I think it's good to have good self-esteem, but not to the point where you think you're better than anybody else, you know, and it kind of goes to strife from the vain glory. That's why it's used here. But then in what? Lowliness of mind. That means you have a humble opinion of yourself. Amen? Modesty, humility, the correct estimate of ourselves. You know, it says in the Word, it says that if you uh, humble yourself in the sight of God, He will lift you up. So, you know, when when God lifts you up to a place of higher position, then it's done correctly. He promotes you. Amen. We don't have to promote ourselves. Let each esteem others than, better than themselves. All right? That means to consider and deem and think. So let us esteem or consider and deem others better than ourselves. Now, again, it's not to have a hateful spirit about yourself. It's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you yield, you know. It's like you make somebody feel like they're the most special one in the room and stuff instead of talking about yourself and stuff. Verse 4. Look not every man on his what? His own things, but in every man also in the things of others. So let us have basically a self-sacrifice spirit, if you will. And, and it be unselfish. Don't be selfish. Look not on every man his own things, but every, every man also in the things of others. Then it says this in verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which was what? Also in Christ Jesus. The mind here is the same word as verse 2. Cherish the same views, one mind and like-minded. I have the mind of Christ. <clears throat> now here's, this is really a fascinating uh, few scriptures here. Who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. Now, there's a lot of theology in here, but we'll just simplify it. Who thought, you know, being in the form of God, you know Jesus Christ was God. But he was also a man. Alright, he came <clears throat> to show, you know, himself to the world. God the Father gave us Christ Jesus. He lived here 33 and a half years, amen. And so he was a perfect example. But could he perform miracles? Yes, but he saw when he saw what his father did, that's what he did. He was in total submission. And we'll see that in a little bit. Robbery means a thing seized or something to be thing. He didn't think it was form that, you know, this not robbery to be equal or in quality or quantity. That's what it means. All right, let's move on to verse 7. But what happened? But made himself, now I want you to take note of that, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And again, my friends, the exalted servant, mind you. The form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. So no reputation. That means make empty, 
He laid aside his equality with the form of God and made his reputation the same Greek word as well. But let me, t let me just tell you this here. Here's a fascinating scripture. Uh, this, this is here. Excuse me. And it means, Lord, he, he came without glory. Now think about that. He was born in a manger. We know all that story. You know? That's why I'm kind of leading up to Christmas. I want you to see, I'm kind of prepping you for this, you know. This wonderful baby, if you will. He's not a baby anymore. You know that. But it says he lived among us for 33 and a half years. He died the most horrific way for us, and he assumed the form of a servant. And in verse 8, it kind of explains that, what I just said. He made himself with no reputation. What it says in verse 7, the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men. Verse 8, and being found in a fashion as a man, he what? He humbled himself and became what? Obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. So we and being found fashioned as a man. Now, let me tell you what that means. It means there's a word called habitus, and that means as comprising everything in a person, which strikes the senses, the figure, bearing discourse and action in the manner of life. So he was in a fashion as a man. But what did he do? He humbled himself. He made himself low. That's what it means, reduced to a plane or a humble, a base. You know, can you, can you even imagine... Our Lord, he reduced himself to become down here man for us, to live amongst us, to show an example, and may I submit a perfect example. And, you know, he lived here 30, 33 and a half years, my friends, and he never sinned one time, not one. I feel good if I don't sin, but then if I, if I say I haven't sinned in the last day or so, then it's pride. So I just sinned there. So, I mean, you know, he was a perfect example. He became obedient unto death. Death of the cross, capital punishment for you and me. That's what he did. And I love this. And this is where I talk about the exalted servant here. Here we go. Verse 9. Wherefore God also had highly exalted him and given him a name that's above everything. Now, the word highly exalted, you can probably assume what that means. It means to exalt to the highest rank in power, raise to supreme majesty to make on high. And that's where Jesus Christ needs to be high. Amen? High and lifted up, if you will. But, you know, when you see the word name here in the Bible, and it, let me tell you what it says in the Greek, and I want you to think when I mention the word Jesus Christ. A name which is above every name. So what the name here in the Greek means what is used for everything which the name covers. Jesus is Lord. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. When you think about it, somebody says Jesus Christ, what do you think about well, he's our Lord and Savior. He's love. He's you know, the King of Kings and the Lords of Lords. So that, that whatever that name Jesus Christ encompasses, that's what it means. He's given him a name which is above every name, which is true. All right? That at the name of Jesus, I love the scripture, verse 10, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under earth. Every knee shall bow means it's going to be bent the knee in homage or worship. Things in heaven, those are things that are existing in heaven. The abode of God and the angels, things in earth, that's exist, what's existing on the earth. And even says this, my friend, and things under the earth. It refers to those who dwell in the world, below, and it also means the departed soul. So will that be hell? Are they going to bow their knee? What do you think? I think so. Every knee shall bow in homage to our Lord and King. I don't know how that's going to look, but I know it says it. So guess what? I believe it. Under earth. I can't think of anything under earth besides maybe hell. And again, I may be off, but think about it. It's something to think about. Verse 11. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. The word confess means you're going to acknowledge openly and joyfully. Give praise to, to admit, to profess and confess that's true. What? That Jesus Christ is Lord. This title is given to God the Messiah, the Master, Owner, our Master, our Owner. That Jesus Christ is Lord to what? The glory of God the Father. You know, it's interesting, my friends. I've shared this with my church here. You know, I was I do a lot of studying, and then a lot of times when I'm in my office here that you see me, especially on Wednesdays, I do a lot of studying. For our Bible study on Wednesday. So I'll sometimes do, you know, I'll get on YouTube and, you know, I'm a guitar guy. And so I'll look at maybe some hot rods. I'm a hot rod guy too. 
I'll look at something like that. But there was this one thing that caught me, and it talked about people that mock God. And so I clicked on it. My friends, I could not believe these movie stars, and they're currently alive today. And what vileness they said against God, you know, because they've done it on their own and all that. You know, I'm not going to mention no names. But they need to repent. It broke my heart because they were using foul language, and they alluded to him as nothing. Well, he's king of king and lord of lords in my book. I know it is in yours. You know, this kind, this kind of disrespect and blasphemy, is just, it's getting rampant. But as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord, and I will give him praise because he is the king. Amen? But it's sad, you know, and I, I just clicked on it. I didn't watch the whole thing. It kind of bo you know, bothered me really bad, so I just clicked went on to something else, but, you know, it's just weird. People are like that. You know, what did he do for them? He did everything, and yet they hate him. And they, he's done nothing but bless them. All right, now we're going we're gonna to look about also in the Old Testament where it talks about the exalted servant. And I'm going to be in Isaiah 52 to start with, and then we'll go back a few chapters, about 10 chapters later on here. So as it's up here. Now here's what it says here. I'm going to be in 50, 52, excuse me, from verses 13. 15, and it reads, Behold, my servant shall deal, deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Hallelujah. As many were astonied, it says astonied at thee. That's what it says in the King James. His visage was so marred more than any man, and his form more than any sons of men. In verse 15, so shall he sprinkle many nations, that kings shall shut their mouths at him, for that which has not been told, told them, Shall they see, and that which they had not heard, shall they consider? Oh, this is awesome. So here in Isaiah 52, 13, it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, and shall be exalted, and stolen in time. Uh, the servant is the most outstanding reference to who? Guess who? The Messiah in the Old Testament. One of them. It's one of many. But here it's just one that just puts it out there. There are others, but this is one big one, too. He, what's he going to do? He's going to deal prudently. Or he's going to act with insight. He's going to teach and act with devotion, which he did. He shall be exalted. Now, we just read that in Philippians, to be set on high and raised up on high. And then he's going to be extolled. What's that mean? Again, to be lifted up and be exalted and be very high, to make him high and exalted. Here, the servant of the Lord will be high and exalted. Amen? Yes, before him. Then it says, this word here, it's, it's called astonied. And I said, I said it long ago. As many were astonied, okay, as the his visage was marred more than any man in his form, more than any son of man. Now that word astonied, and it, you know, a lot of people think it says astonished. Maybe that's true, but it, here in the King James it says astonished. And that means many were dismayed or amazed, okay, and there's a word called consternation, kind of another word that says what? Of the vid, visit, the appearance, what is what was seen. He was so what? Marred. All right, now let me tell you about this. The word marred means disfigurement of face. He was disfigurement of face. It is used of the terrible disfigurement or distortion of a person's appearance. Here it describes the appearance of the what? Servant of the Lord. Marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. Now, I made this comment. They're, they're kind of doing some, with modern technology that they have. They're taking the shroud of Turin and, and, and making it look like maybe what this person looked like. All right. Well, I saw the image of it, you know, it was on, again on a YouTube thing. And it did kind of give us the appearance of what we would depict as Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not saying it is, I'm just saying. And it showed that he had marks all over. But here's the thing, my friends. His face was recognizable. This here, it says, he was so marred, which means disfigurement of face. And it's used of a terrible disfigurement or distortion of a person's appearance. Well, to be frank, it wasn't like that when I saw that image. Because when I, when I see somebody that's deformed and stuff, you don't recognize it. I'm not saying it's a fake. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying the Bible says he was so marred. What will I believe? I will believe what the word says. He was he was disfigured. I can't imagine what he took the blows. 
Now, you guys, if you've ever been in a fight, and you watch anybody get corked in the jaw and stuff, a lot of times, just one time, it'll knock it right over. Your eyes will swell up. You can't even see. And that's just if you get into a little fight. This guy was beaten. Amen? This guy, our Lord. I want to show respect to that guy. So, let's move on. Verse 15. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which I had not been to had not been told, them shall they shall see, and that which they had not heard, they shall what consider. Now the word sprinkle here, it means it's a word called naza, and it means this word sprinkle means to leap into spring, especially with the connotation of surprise or joy. So if there's going to be a, he shall sprinkle many nations. So surprise connotation of surprise or joy. All right, kings will shut their mouth. And what's that mean? Shut, shut up and stop up and close. So I want to give you a side thing from a preacher back in, a Bible teacher back in 1832. And here's what he said. I thought it was really good and I want to put it on you. This is not me. This is this brother. It's believed his gospel shall so prevail that all opposition shall be finally overcome and kings will be overwhelmed with confusion and become speechless before the doctrines of truth when they hear these declared that they shall attentively consider them and their truth shall be the consequence. And that's something the truth should be the consequence. I thought that was pretty good. A man named Adam Clark back in 1832 commented the Bible class. Interesting. So let me give you some side scriptures that will complement, you know, like a lot of times the gospel was veiled for the most part. People didn't understand. Here's Romans 15, 21. But as it is written, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. So our leaders in our nation will hopefully get that. Amen? How would you like our leaders to start listening? You know, it would be a blessing. So our leaders, I'm hoping, they get interested and they hear, and they don't understand. I pray they start to understand and start changing their ways and getting this country back the way it should be. Romans 16, verses 25 and 26. Now unto him that is of the power to establish you according to to my gospel and preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of what? The mystery which was kept what? Secret uh, since the world began. So it's gonna when he sprinkles the nations and stuff, it's gonna be it's gonna come out. Verse 26. But now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of everlasting God, made known to who? All nations for what? For the obedience of faith. Listen. Especially here in the United States, you and I are without excuse. This gospel, there's a church on every corner. I know some of them are kind of falling away from God somewhat. You know, you if you want to find a good church, you can find one. I'd ask, I would encourage you to do it. This is Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 4. Let me look at the screen for that one. Behold, my servant, again, this is God's promise concerning his servant, and may I submit the exalted servant. Behold, my servant, whom I uphold, my elect, in whom my soul delighteth. I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth a judgment to the Gentiles. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. I'll clarify that in a minute. Verse 3. A bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. Verse 4. And he shall not fail, nor be discouraged, till he have set judgment in the earth, and the isles shall wait for his law. Alright, so here we go. Behold, it says, my servant and whom I, a mine elect and whom I so delight, I put my spirit upon him and he shall bring forth judgment to the Gentile. That judgment means justice and right and ordinance of case and cause. Okay, I'll read it again. Justice, right, and ordinance, case and cause. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. Now, what that means is this. He shall not cry. He's not going to cry aloud. He's not going to make an outcry or shouting, nor lift up or be exalted to be lift up self, nor, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. What's that mean? He won't be loud or angry and shout out there. It's not how Christ was. If you go through the Gospels, you see how he taught very calmly, very quietly. I mean, you know, uh, on the Mount of Olives and with his disciples, he didn't shout or yell like, hey, what's the matter with you guys? It wasn't like that at all. He was always humble and he was truthful. And uh, what, what else? He was full of mercy. And so he wouldn't shout or stuff like that. And that's why he was a humble servant. In verse 3, a bruised reed shall he not break, and smoking flash 
shall he flax, excuse me, shall he not quench. He shall bring forth judgment on the truth. Alright. So a bruise means he's if he's crushed or oppressed, if he was, but the crushed reed, stalk or water plant, and there's a word called calamus. The smoking flax. Alright? That smoking flax was uh, dim or dull or faint. It's a wick for lamps, smoking flax, a faintly burning lamp. So he shall not quench, not extinguish, which he won't. He shall bring forth judgment unto truth. What's that? Faithfulness, reliableness, sureness, and divine instruction. Now get this in verse 4. He shall not fail, nor be discouraged. He shall, he shall have set judgment in the earth, and isles shall wait for his law. Or law. I said law. Law. He shall not fail. How many know Christ did not fail? No. He didn't grow weak. He didn't grow dim. He didn't falter. And he didn't restrain. No. He didn't. He didn't fail. He didn't grow weak or grow dim. He was not discouraged. He didn't wasn't crushed. He was wounded for our our you know our sins and stuff. But he wasn't crushed and discouraged or anything like that or oppressed or broken. So let me give you a little sideline here before I close. Our exalted servant, this is it in a nutshell, if you will, shall not fail. Grow weak, grow dim, or be restrained. And someday he will set judgment in the earth and the isles. What's that mean? That is the islands, the coastlands, the regions, and may I submit other countries shall wait for his law and direction and instruction. And what? Instruction in the messianic age. Amen. The gospel is being preached. And we need to hear it. He was the exalted servant. Why do I do this? I did this before Christmas because this wonderful baby that we're going to celebrate the virgin birth here on Christmas. And Christmas, by the way, happens to be on Sunday. So that will be kind of cool. But we'll have a place of refuge. We'll have a, um, a New Year's Eve, or not New Year's Eve, excuse me, Christmas Eve service. And we'll have Christmas. And it's all on the weekend. So this will be really cool. This is the uh, first time in a long time that uh, Christmas has ended up on a Sunday. So I hope this ministered to you. Remember, he is the exalted servant. Was a servant even appointed unto death. Amen. And he did that for us. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Our exalted servant is Jesus Christ. We love him with our whole heart. I pray that you bless these folks and decree. No weapon formed against them will prosper. I pray, Father, like it says in here, the isles, the region, may I submit, the United States will hear the gospel and change their way. So bless these folks. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen to your glory. Hallelujah, folks. I'll see you next week. God bless you.